I mean, something went wrong. And these people were, there was a book written in the late 60s, had a lot of pictures in it, I don't remember the name of it, but it showed all these portraits of all these people that were highly successful in the hedge fund business, but they didn't bring out a second edition. They, a very high percentage of them bit the dust, including suicides, cab drivers, uh, subsequent employment, the whole thing. Uh, so it, 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 it's just tough. I would say that people that are now investing in hedge funds in aggregate are going to be disappointed. Uh, you don't get smarter because you're running uh, something called a hedge fund or something called private equity or something you know called anything, uh, an LBO fund. But what you do gain periodically is the ability to merchandise those things. I mean, they're, they're, there are fads in Wall Street and Wall Street will sell what it can sell. Just remember that, you know, that may be as good as what the fellow quoted up in the upper levels there. And the hedge fund uh, it right now is in the midst of a fad. It's distinguished not, 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 not by the ability to make more money. It's distinguished by the extraordinary amount of fees that are collected. And believe me, if the world on $600 billion of money is paying 2% fees and a percentage of the profits and the losers go out of existence and the winners continue for a while and take money off the table. It is not going to be a great experience in aggregate for, for investors. There, obviously, there are a few smart, honest people out there running funds and, and they, can, they will do quite well. But if you buy, the, buy them across the board, in my view, you're going to get a bad result. Charlie? Yeah, why would you want to invest with a guy whose basic thought process runs something like this? If, if a second layer of fees on top of a first layer of substantial fees is good for an investor, then a third layer of fees must be better yet. Why would you invest with somebody with a proposition like that? Just the idea of taking 2%, you know, plus percentages on top of that, I mean, that, that reflects, you know, it may be what the traffic can bear, you know, Collis B. Huntington style, but that reflects an attitude toward uh, people that we tend to regard as partners, investors. Uh, I just, I think it's a basically unfair type of arrangement, and I don't like getting in, in general, I think it's a mistake to get in with people who, who propose unfair arrangements. That, uh, you know, they, in effect, they're getting they're probably getting four times standard fees to begin with, and then on top of that, they say well, we want part of the action. and And I would guess in many of those cases that they don't have all of their own money in in the fund themselves. Maybe they have a substantial sum outside. Uh, Charlie and I both run uh, ran uh, partnerships in the '60s and '50s with me, and into the '70s with him. That would generally be classified as hedge funds. They had the compensation arrangement somewhat similar to all, though not like they are now. And we did some, they, they had some similarities, but, but I don't think, uh, uh, I don't think we had quite the attitude toward the, the people we were trying to, that were, were asking to join us, uh, that the present managers have. It's, as Charlie said, the fund to fund type stuff, I mean, it, it's, it's really sort of unbelievable just piling on layer after layer on costs. It doesn't make the companies that are underlying these stocks they buy any better. I mean, it, and, and, and believe me, people don't become a genius just because you walk into some office and it says hedge funds on the door. I mean, they are, what they may be very good at is marketing. In fact, if they're good at marketing, they don't have to be good at anything else. <laughs> Many people think of A.W. Jones, uh, who was a fortune writer at one time, uh, and who developed the best known hedge fund, uh, whenever it was in the early 60s or thereabouts, maybe the late 50s even. And for the rest, for some of the audience, the, the idea originally with A.W. Jones is that, that they would go long and short more or less equal amounts and have a market neutral fund so that it didn't make any difference which way the market went. They didn't really stick with that over time, and I'm not even sure whether A.W. Jones uh, said that they would, but uh, 
they, you know, sometimes they'd be 140% long and 80% short, so they'd have a 60% net long or whatever it might be. They, they had, they were not market neutral throughout the period, but they did operate on the theory of being long stocks that seemed underpriced and short stocks that were overpriced. Uh, even the Federal Reserve, in a report they made on the long-term capital management situation a few years ago, credited A.W. Jones with being sort of the father of this theory of hedge funds. Uh, as Mickey Newman, if he's still here, knows, uh, I think it was in 1924 that Ben Graham set up the Benjamin Graham Fund, which was designed exactly along those lines, and which even used paired securities. In other words, he would look at General Motors and Chrysler and 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 decide which he thought was undervalued relative to the other and go long one and short the other. So the idea, and he was paid a percentage of the profits, and it had all these hedge funds, except it was started in 1924. And I don't know that Ben was the first on that, but I know that he was 30 years ahead of it. Uh, the one that the Federal Reserve credited with being the first and that uh, many people still talk about as being the first A.W. Jones. Ben did not find that particularly successful. Uh, and he even wrote about it uh, some in, his, in, in terms of uh, the problems he encountered with that approach. And my memory is that a quite high percentage of the paired investments worked out well. He was right. The undervalued one went up and the overvalued or, or the, the spread between the two narrowed. But the one time out of four or whatever it was that he was wrong uh, lost a lot more money than than the average of the three that he was right on. And uh, you know, all I can say is that uh, uh, I've, I've shorted stocks in my life and had one particularly harrowing experience in 1954. Uh, and I have, I can't, I can hardly think of a situation where I was wrong if viewed from 10 years later, but I can think of some ones where I was certainly wrong from the view of 10 weeks later, which happened to be the relevant period, and, and during which my net worth was evaporating and my liquid assets were getting less liquid and so on. So it's all I can tell you is very difficult. And the interesting thing about it, of course, is A.W. Jones was a darling of the uh, of the uh, late 1960s. And Carol Loomis is here, and she wrote an article called The Jones Nobody Keeps Up With. And it's a very interesting article. But nobody's writing article, nobody was writing articles about A.W. Jones in 1979. Uh, I mean, something went wrong. And there were spinoffs from his operation. Carl Jones spun off from his operation. Dick Radcliffe spun off from his operation. They were, you can go down the list. And out of many, many, many that, that left, they, a very high percentage of them bit the dust, including suicides, cab drivers, uh, subsequent employment, the whole thing. And these people were, there was a book written in the late 60s, had a lot of pictures in it. I don't remember the name of it, but it showed all these portraits of all these people that were highly successful in the hedge fund business, but they didn't bring out a second edition. Uh, so it, 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 it's just tough. I, I, logically, it should work well, but the, the math of only, you, you can't short a lot of something. You can buy till the cows come home if you got the money. You can buy the whole company if you but you can't short the whole company. Uh, fellow named Robert Wilson, there's some interesting stories about He's a very, very smart guy, and he took a trip off to Asia one time being short I think it was Resorts International, or maybe it was Mary Carter Paint, it was still called in those days. And he lost a lot of money before he got back to this country. He's a very smart guy. He made a lot of money shorting stocks, but it just takes one to kill you. And, and you need more and more money as the stock goes up. You don't need more and more money when a stock goes down if you paid for it originally and didn't buy it on margin. You just sit and find out whether you were right or not. But you can't necessarily sit and find out whether you're right on being short of stock.